The church say amen. The church say amen again. Let's put our hands together this morning and give God praise for allowing us once again to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. This is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful to be alive and in the house of mercy and grace on today. You ought to look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm glad to be here. Or find somebody else that really is excited this morning. Say, neighbor, I'm just glad to be in the service. Come on and give God praise to this place. Hallelujah. Prayer protocol this morning is our youth and young adult morning. And so we have young people ushering, singing, picking up, offering, doing everything possible. Please support our young people on today as they lead us in praise and worship on this morning. Clap your hands, stomp your feet as if that was your little baby or your little grandchild up here singing their hearts out. Amen. Amen. Let us have our opening song and go to God in worship.
Heavenly Father, that you bless our pastor, bless our assistant minister, Heavenly Father. Give them grace, give them knowledge, give them understanding, Heavenly Father, from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Bless them, Heavenly Father, with the word from us today, that we might leave this place stronger than we came. Father God, we ask, Heavenly Father, that you just be with us, Heavenly Father, in our sickness, in our distress, 
in our times of bereavement. For you said, Heavenly Father, that you are with us and you will never forsake us. So we ask, dear Lord, that you just come into this place and have your way. Bless our pastor and give him a word from upon high that will prick our hearts and help someone to come and say, what must I do to be saved? We love you, Lord. We magnify you. We lift you up because you're worthy to be praised. So our only request is that you have your way in this place. And when we leave this place, Heavenly Father, we will say it was truly good for us to have been here. We praise you, Lord. We lift you up because you're worthy. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Come on, church. Let's give God praise this morning. If you know you need more of God, won't you give up praise? The song says, give me you. Lord, give me you. Everything else can wait. Come on, if that's your prayer this morning, you ought to lift your hands in this place and say, God, we need more of you. We need more of your power. We need more of your grace. We need more of your mercy. Come on, give him praise in this place. Everything else can wait. Give me you. I hope I'm not too late. Come on, lift your hands right here. Come on, give him praise. Give me you. Build that up. Lord, give me you. Lord, give me you. Give me you. Can we say that one more time? Give me you. Everything else can wait. Lift your hands in worship. Lord, give me you. I hope I'm not too late. I don't know if you need him this morning, but say, give me you. Lord, give me you. Lord, give me you. I need more power, more strength, more mercy. Lord, give me you. Lift those hands right there. My life is not my own. I wish I had a worshiper. To you I belong. I give myself. I give myself to you. I wish I had somebody who can lift their hands right here. My life is not my own. Oh, but you, to you I belong. Oh, I give myself. I give myself to you. Can you lift that up and say, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself. Oh, I'm almost done with you. Right here, help me worship. My life is not my own. To you I belong. Oh, oh. Yeah. I feel all right. Get on your feet if you're able right here. Give God worship. The song says, oh, open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. Can y'all bother? Can I bother you for a few minutes? Let it rain. My mind. Open the floodgates of heaven. Let it rain. I wish I had a worshiper right here. Oh, let it rain. You ought to bother somebody next to you and say, I feel the rain. Tell somebody, I feel the rain. Y'all ain't talking to nobody. Oh, I feel the rain. Oh, I feel the rain. You ought to bother your neighbor and say, it's raining. Oh, it's raining. Oh, oh it's raining. Whatever you need is in here this morning. It's raining. Say, oh, God, open the floodgates 
give God praise right here. Come on, give him glory in this place. Come on, open up your mouth and give him glory. If you're grateful just to be alive, if you're grateful just to be above ground, you ought to lift your hands right here. He didn't have to wake you up this morning. He didn't have to keep you all week long. He didn't have to put a roof over your head, clothes on your back, shoes on your feet. But in his grace and in his mercy, he kept me when I couldn't keep myself. You ought to shake a neighbor and say, neighbor, if it had not been, y'all ain't bothering nobody. Tell him if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah, yeah, hallelujah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Y'all can sit down. I just wanted to make sure y'all were alive this morning. Amen. 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 We thank God for these young people. Come on, give it up for them. These young people who have led us in praise and worship and devotion. We thank God for them and their diligent efforts and endeavors to serve in the house of the Lord. As we continue in the spirit of praise and worship, we want to get ready for our tithes and our offering. Uh, we want to bring before the Lord what rightfully belongs to him. Uh, we know that God has been good to us, better to us than we can even be to ourselves. And all he asks is that we would consider his house and take care of it the way we take care of our own houses. The prophet Haggai gave an indictment to the southern tribe of Judah that they take so good care of their own homes with their picket fences and cut grass and wonderful shrubs. But the house of God lay in ruins. The prophet challenged them, consider your ways. And remember what God has entrusted you with as stewards in his vineyard. And I pray that however God has purpose for you to give in your heart, uh, that you would do so on this morning. We have our young people that's going to come forth and lead us along with the deacons. And however the Spirit of God moves upon you, I pray that you would be obedient and bring to him what rightfully belongs to him. Amen? At this time, you are in the hands of our young ushers and our deacons who will guide us. In the offertory period. Amen. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. Trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. Oh, I will trust in the Lord till I die. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm gonna stay on the battlefield. I'm gonna stay on the battlefield till I die. I'm gonna stay on the battlefield. I'm gonna stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right. 
body right till I die. Oh, I'm going to treat everybody right. I'm going to treat every, everybody right. I'm going to treat everybody right till I die. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you. For those who have given on today, we thank you for those who may have wanted to give, but for some reason were unable to do so. Father God, we ask that these resources may be used for the building and edification of your kingdom. That your will may be done in earth as it is in heaven. Father God, reciprocate back unto the giver many fold for their generosity. Father God, give seed to the sower so that we can continue to give it to your kingdom. Father God, let no kind gesture be unnoticed. But give unto us in good measure, press down and shake it together. These and many blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I'm gonna watch, fight and pray. I'm gonna watch, fight and pray. I'm gonna watch, fight and pray till I die. Can we stand for the reading of the word of God? John chapter 5. I'm gonna watch. Fight and pray. I'm gonna watch. Watch, fight and pray. I'm gonna watch. Fight and pray. Till I die. John chapter 5. A very familiar passage of scripture found in the fifth gospel, fifth chapter rather of the Gospel of John, John chapter 5. And although verse 1 is there for informational purposes and setting, we're going to start at verse number 2. John 5 and 2, if you have it, say amen. amen. All I ask is that you make all that noise you made last Sunday for that guest preacher <laughs> on this morning, amen. Y'all were knocking down chandeliers and ripping up carpet up in here. I want that same energy. <laughs> oh, today. Amen. Amen. John chapter 5. John chapter 5, starting at verse 2. If you haven't say preacher, I haven't. John 5, verse 2, starting at that second verse. Here in the New King James Version, you'll find these words recorded. Now there is in Jerusalem, uh, by the sheep gate, a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind people, lame people, paralyzed people, who were all waiting for the moving of the water. Verse 4, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool, and stirred up the water, that whoever stepped in it first, after the stirring of the water, would be made well and whole of whatever disease he had. Now there was a certain man who was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, Jesus said to this man, do you want to be made whole? The sick man answered him and said, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another person steps down before I get there. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, rise Take up your bed and walk. And immediately, someone shout immediately. immediately. The man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day, 
was the Sabbath day. The grass withers, the flower there fadeth away. The word of our Lord shall stand forever. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, ushers, for your service on this morning. Uh, while we're together in your hearing, I'd like to talk about this topic. A God who helps the hopeless. A God who helps the hopeless. Look at a neighbor. Say, neighbor. neighbor. The, preacher the preacher wants to talk about a God who helps the hopeless. A God who helps the hopeless. My brothers and sisters, in the field of social psychology, we have a term known as overgeneralization. An overgeneralization is a cognitive dissonance where a person makes a very broad assumption based on very limited experience. Overgeneralization. Let me give you an example of that. An overgeneralization is when a college student says to themselves, I'll never graduate with my degree after failing just one test. Overgeneralization is when a young man says, I'll never be able to get a job just because his first application was rejected. Overgeneralizing is when a young lady says, I'll never be able to find a man after having just one bad relationship. Some of y'all are laughing because you've been there. Over generalizing where we make one broad sweeping assumption after having just a limited experience. Brothers and sisters, many of us are guilty of this very cognitive dissonance because we allow one bad day one rough season, one hard time in our lives to bring us so low to a place of despair and frustration that we start assuming that we'll never make it out of this hole. We'll never find success again. We'll never get back on our feet because of the depth and the brevity of one moment of failure in our lives. But brothers and sisters, when you are a child of God, you cannot allow overgeneralization and false broad assumptions to push you into a place of hopelessness and despair. Because when you are a child of God, you realize that you will have moments of darkness when you fall in life. But your character as a Christian is not determined by whether or not you fall but rather is determined by whether or not you get back up again after you've fallen. The Bible says that a just man falls seven times. Do I have a witness here? But somewhere around time number eight, we get back up again because we know that even though night seasons may get dark in our lives, it won't be forever because joy will eventually come in the morning. That's why if you are a child of God, you should encourage yourself and remind yourself that you already have the victory. No matter how many losses you may experience. Yes, you may lose battles, but you've already won the war. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. To that young person applying for a job, keep on applying. Yes, sir. Because eventually the God you serve will open up a door of opportunity. To that college student that's struggling, keep on studying and keep on pushing. Because eventually God will give you the wisdom and insight you need to be successful in life. To that single woman who can't get a break, don't let one bad mess up ruin it for every man you ever meet. Because everybody is not as crazy as your ex. Do I have a witness here? 
Yes, you will have failures. Yes, you will fall short. Yes, you will stumble. But the character of a Christian is to get back up again after you've had your fall. We don't overgeneralize as believers because we already know who holds the future. We already know that our failures are not final. But eventually God will make a way for us somehow, some way, in due season, if we faint not. The man in our text, brothers and sisters, has unfortunately allowed himself to sl slip into hopelessness and despair. Because he has overgeneralized his situation in a way to where he feels that change is never going to visit him in this life he lives. It's right here in the verse he says there is no man, no, man, no, man. no person on this planet who wants to help a poor soul like me. Not even realizing that the one man who can help him and change his life is standing right in front of his face. But because of hopelessness, because of despair, he is getting ready to miss an encounter of a lifetime because he has assumed that there is no hope for his situation and condition. Brothers and sisters, let us examine this man this morning. Let us walk in his shoes just for a few moments so that we can learn valuable lessons today on how we ought to be careful not to write off our future just because of a few mistakes in our past. Brothers and sisters, everybody in here under the sound of my voice who is in Christ Jesus is a new creature. Colored folk might remember your past. But in the record of heaven, you are a new creature born again. Don't let your past failures prevent you from missing an opportunity of a lifetime. When God shows up at your doorstep and asks the very same question, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to change? Do you want a better life for yourself? Yes, Brothers and sisters, John opens up this inter interesting story uh, by first giving us the setting and the scenario at hand. Uh, the Bible says in verse 2 that now in this particular part of the narrative, Jesus has come to a place where in Jerusalem there is a sheep gate near a pool. This pool in the Hebrew tongue is known as Bethesda, which literally means house of mercy. And it has five porches, plenty of room for people to gather around this particular pool. And the Bible says that this pool of Bethesda near the sheep gate is a particular hangout spot for a certain crowd of people. People that are impotent. People that are lame. People that are crippled. People that have physical abnormalities. This is the hangout spot for everybody who's suffering with something and has some kind of infirmity and ailment that is keeping them from being 100%. The reason why they are gathered right here, the text says, is because ever so often, at a certain time and in a certain season, the water in the pool will start to move. It would become troubled in the old King James to where the water would begin to stir somehow by itself. And they believe that when that water would start moving, that inside that moving water, there was a supernatural power from some angelic force to where the first person who stepped in the water while the water was troubled would receive a healing like never before. And John is careful to, 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 to note that near this pool, there is a sheep gate. The sheep gate was the place where all of the sheep that were getting ready to be sacrificed at the temple would enter into the city. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You'd well know that according to Levitical law, when you sacrifice the sheep or a lamb to be offered and slaughtered, it had to be a lamb without blemish, a lamb without spot. 
could not have any abnormalities. I wish y'all saw me here. Could not have any problems with it. There were beautiful, spotless, spotless sheep coming through this sheep gate. But next to that sheep gate was a pool where there was another flock of sheep. Sheep that weren't spotless. Sheep that had blemishes. Sheep that had problems. Sheep that had abnormalities. The perfect sheep were coming through the gate. But the messed up sheep, the messed up sheep were hanging by the pool. I wish I had a witness here. And the Bible says the good shepherd took time to stop by the pool where the ugly sheep were. The good shepherd, while everybody else was worried about the parade of beautiful sheep heading to the temple, Jesus, the son of God, goes by the pool where the messed up sheep were. And he goes there to help somebody who was unable to help themselves. He's a good shepherd that don't mind helping ugly sheep. And brothers and sisters, I don't know about you this morning, but the only reason why I'm standing here before you is because Jesus is a shepherd who doesn't mind tending to messed up sheep. Doesn't mind tending to sheep that have problems. Doesn't mind tending to sheep that have issues. And the only reason why I made it this far, and the only reason why many of you have made it this far, is because you have a good shepherd that don't mind looking after crazy sheep. Infirm sheep, impotent sheep, sheep that fall, sheep that are broken, sheep that have problems. I'm so glad that Jesus don't mind looking after ugly sheep. He goes to the pool where the impotent sheep are. Where they have gathered at this pool called Bethesda. This house of mercy. Because they are looking for a moving of the water. So that when the water moves, they can step on in. And receive the deliverance they've been standing in need of. These lame people believed. That when the power of God moved in the water, whatever miracle they stood in need of was automatically available. So here it is. Here's your shout. Anybody that had an issue, anybody that had a problem, anybody that had trouble, they would gather at Bethesda. Because at Bethesda, there was a moving of God that they believed would bring about healing. And brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but that's why I gather in the church house every Sunday morning. That's why I come to Bethesda every Sunday I have a chance to. Because I believe that when we gather on one accord in one place, the Holy Ghost will start moving things. The Holy Ghost will start shifting things. And whatever blessing that you stand in need of is here in the house of mercy. If you would only press your way to get here and receive what God has for you. I I wish I had somebody who could testify and say, Pastor, that's why I woke up early and made my way across the tracks over here. I'm not here just for form or fashion. I'm not here just to see what everybody got on. I'm not here just to see who made it to church and who got something interesting to say about last night or Friday evening. I'm here because it's the house of mercy. I'm here because there's a place for me. I have an issue. I have a problem. I have a trouble and I am here today so that when God starts stirring stuff, y'all missing me here, I'll be in prime position to receive the blessing I need. I wish I had a witness in here who would look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm here to receive something. I'm waiting for the stirring of the water. I'm waiting for the preaching of the word. I'm waiting for the praise and worship to go up. I'm not here for any mess or gossip or foolishness. I'm here to receive mercy and obtain help for my time of need. Our brothers and sisters, they are gathered at this pool in our text. And they are gathered here with great expectation. That at the moving and stirring of the water, something will be available for them that they've never had before. 
the Bible is clear to indicate exactly what they believed was happening when this water started moving. It's right there in verse 4. They believed that at the moving of the water, an angel would come down from heaven. And that angel would begin to stir and move things in the place. And the rule of thumb was whoever was the first person to step into the pool when the water was troubled was the person that would receive the blessing. There are some that like to write this verse off as inauthentic because it's not included in some of the earliest manuscript copies of the Bible. There are some who like to say, well, this was just merely a superstition and that there was really no angel stirring up anything with that water moved. But despite whether or not it's fact or fiction, fiction, whether it was original or added in, all I know is that these people who had problems and issues gathered at this place because they believed that when the angel showed up, their miracle would be waiting for the first person who could get to it. But brothers and sisters, there was a great difficulty about this situation. It was difficult because the window of opportunity was very, very small for you to be able to get this blessing. First of all, you had to be gathered around the pool at the right time in a certain season. And you had to make sure that you got a good spot in line because the moment the water started moving, you had to be the first one to step in. There was one miracle, one healing for the one person who stepped in the water at the right time. And that's why, brothers and sisters, we have the complexity that we have in the text this morning. Because this particular man, infirmed and crippled, unable to move as he wants, could not make it within this window of opportunity. He could not be the first in line when the water moved because he had nobody to help him in the midst of his struggle. And so for almost 40 years he lay there, helpless and hopeless, hoping that somebody would help him. Y'all missing me here? Because he could not help himself. Brothers and sisters, if you really study the scenario of this man, you will realize that you can identify with him in various ways. Because all of us have had seasons in our lives where we were paralyzed by life and unable to move and do the things that we needed to do because of troubles and burdens that were on every hand. And the only reason why we made it out of that paralysis is because there was a man who was willing to come to where we were and give us the grace and the help that we needed in our time of despair. See, some of y'all not go shout right here. Because you don't want to admit that there were times in your life where you were crippled. Times in your life where you were impotent. Time in your life where you were paralyzed. You might have not been paralyzed in your body, but you were paralyzed in sin. Paralyzed in depression. Paralyzed in anxiety. Paralyzed in low self-esteem. Hell and high water on every hand. Finances in a mess. Couldn't move like you wanted to. Couldn't pay bills like you wanted to. Have you ever been paralyzed? Paralyzed by a bad divorce. Paralyzed by an abusive relationship. Paralyzed by doors that were slammed in your face. You used to move around and do what it was you were doing. But life crippled you. Death in your family crippled you. Life tragedies made you numb. And you were unable to do what you were destined to do in that season. Unless you had help from Jesus. See, many of us not going to shout right here because we don't like to admit that we need help. I know you want to put on a facade like you got it going on for everybody in the prosperous Mount Calvary Baptist Church of New Iberia, Louisiana. But I wish I had about 10 people who can say, Pastor, you in my driveway right here. Because I don't mind admitting that there are seasons when I need help. Seasons where I'm not 100%. Seasons where I don't feel like pressing my way. Seasons where I don't feel like doing what God has called 
want me to do. And I wouldn't have made it through that season had it not been for the help and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. See, some of y'all know what I'm talking about because you paralyzed right now. Won't speak to nobody. Barely come out the house. Won't come to church. Won't pick up your Bible because you're paralyzed and you're hurt by how life has treated you. But I came to tell you this morning that if you've been paralyzed by the troubles of life, you qualify for mercy and for grace and for power on this morning. I wish I had somebody who could be transparent, lift their hands right here and say, Pastor, I ain't ashamed to say it. I need help. I need God to step in. I need a move right now. If God don't make a way, I don't know how I'm going to make it until next week. I'm in the house. I'm at the pool because I'm looking for something that can help me. Shake a neighbor's hand and say, I need help. I need help. I need prayer. I, I need your support. I, I need the strength of the Lord. I, I'm going through a paralyzed season and I need grace and I need mercy. Here it is, beloved. They, uh, they were gathered. I didn't woke up now. They didn't gather at the pool. Don't miss your shout. Here it is. Looking for the trouble. Why y'all missing me here? The troubling of the water. They weren't looking for peaceful waters. Ah, they were looking for troubled waters. Because in this particular situation, troubled water meant healing water. I preach it better than y'all listening. When, as long as the water was still, nobody moved. As long as the water was peaceful, nobody jumped. But the moment the water started stirring, immediately everybody would run to jump in. Because they believed, here it is, that the blessing that they stood in need of was waiting for them in the troubled water. Now I know David told you that the Lord would make you lie down in green pastors. Uh, and I know David told you that the Lord would lead you beside still waters. But I got news for you this morning, Mount Calvary. This text is proof to us that sometimes troubled water isn't a bad thing after all. Because sometimes the blessing you need is not in peaceful waters. But it's waiting for you in troubled waters. And I want to encourage somebody who's got troubled water right now. Troubled water in your marriage. Troubled water in your finances. Troubled water in your health. I want to encourage you this morning because you ought to not be alarmed by the trouble that's showing up. Because in some situations, the trouble is necessary to prepare you for the next blessing that God is getting ready to drop off. In, in other words, church, don't be bothered by troubled water because your blessing might be waiting for you on the other side of the trouble. I, I wish I had somebody in here who said, Pastor, I'm going through trouble right now. And I have no idea why the Lord is allowing the waters of my life to rage and roar like a tempest. It might just be that God is setting you up for what you've been asking for and what you've been standing in need of, but it's not gonna come until after some trouble. I, I wish I had somebody who can testify that, Pastor, there were times in my life where the blessing that I needed showed up at my doorstep after I went through some stuff, after I cried some tears, after some folk walked out on me, after life disappointed me, and right when I thought it was all over, God stepped in with my blessing, but it didn't come until after troubled waters. Oh, they were waiting for troubled waters because they knew their blessing would be in the trouble. 
Uh, brothers and sisters, as I hurry on, there are just three more things that I want to show you. Somebody say three things. Three, three more things that I want to show you about this man that I believe will bless us in our time together. The first thing I want to take a real close look at is his condition. Somebody say his condition. It's right here in the text. The Bible says that there was a lame man, verse 5. A lame man who was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. John, for some reason, is very ambiguous concerning the details about this particular individual. We don't know his name. We don't know his age. We don't know his religious convictions. Matter of fact, we don't even have a proper medical term to identify his condition. We just know that it is an infirmity that keeps him from moving the way he wants to move. And John might be ambiguous in the text because he wants you to plug in your own problem here into the story. But there is one detail that stands out to us in this man's situation. Whatever it is he's been going through, whoever this man is, he's been going through it for 38 years. Nearly four decades. Half of his life at least. And I find it very interesting that John would mention these 38 years because it was nearly 40 years that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness with Moses. It, it was 40 days that Jesus fasted in the Judean wilderness before he was hungry and tempted of the devil. It could be that John, in his own mystical way, is trying to get us to picture this man in a dry wilderness situation where he is thirsty for the healing waters of Bethesda. This man has been going through this situation for nearly 40 years where he is constantly depending on other people to help him to get along. Brothers and sisters, can you imagine how frustrating it must be to be totally helpless and dependent on other people for 40 years of your life? Somebody got to help you to get out of bed in the morning. Somebody got to help you to get to the bathroom and to the kitchen. Somebody got to drive you to your doctor appointment. Somebody has to bring you to church and the Bible study. Nothing you can seriously do for yourself because you are infirmed and lame. And brothers and sisters, you know how frustrating it is to depend on folk. To try to help you when you need them. Depending on folks is always a gamble because folks will only help you when it's convenient for them. That's why you ought to be grateful this morning for every person that helped you along the way. Because folk don't have to be nice. Folk don't have to be kind. But every now and then God will move on somebody's heart to help you when you need it the most. And you better be grateful for the people in your life that genuinely help you instead of looking to get something from you. Uh, this man has to have help in everything that he does, for every place that he goes to, because he's been lame and impotent for almost 40 years. The good news is, brothers and sisters, that on this day, something was a little different in Jerusalem. Because on this day, when he went by the pool, as he was carried there, dropped off, which was normal protocol for him, the Bible says that there was a visitor passing by that pool of Bethesda. And this particular visitor, look at the text, saw him lying there. And not only did he see him laying there, but without looking at any medical history, he already knew the condition that he was in. Boy, y'all missing me here. And this man who sees him there, knowing his condition, walks up to him and asks him the question of a lifetime. Do you want to be made whole? 
Brothers and sisters, what I like about this part is that out of all the people gathered at the pool, out of all the people who were there with problems and situations, God saw this one man approach this one man and gave him the encounter of a lifetime. A man that thought he was overlooked, unnoticed, and neglected has a one-on-one -on -one encounter with the Son of God. And just in case there's somebody in here this morning who feels as though nobody sees your struggle. Just in case there's somebody in here this morning who feels that nobody knows your condition. I want to tell you that there's at least one person who knows all about it. He sees you right where you are, even right now. And even though I can't see past your pretty dress, combed hair, and made up face, Jesus can look right through you. And he sees your condition. And he knows everything that you're going through. And brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but that encourages me this morning. That when people don't know my story, when people can't feel my pain, when people don't see my tears at night, I serve a God who sees me. And not only does he see me on the outside, but he knows me by the feeling of my infirmities on the inside. In other words, we serve a God who doesn't judge us by how we look when we're in public, but he's with us in private he knows our hurt he knows our pain he knows our struggle he sees us when nobody else even passes us by he knows our struggle when nobody else cares to check in on us and to be concerned and he asked this man who he sees and knows is inside and out asked him one powerful and prolific question do you want to be made whole? Notice he didn't ask the man if he just wanted to be healed. Because the word healed would be a totally different word of the Greek text. But he asked this man, do you want to be made whole? Which is healing not just for your body, but also for your mind, for your soul, and for your emotions. Because how many of you know you can be healthy in your body? but still crazy in your mind. You can be peaceful in your outer appearance and still restless inside of your soul because you're healed, but you're not whole. He asked the man, do you want to be made whole? Now, brothers and sisters, I believe that Jesus is still asking that same question. 2,000 years later, in our world today. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to change for the better? Are you ready for what change and transition will bring into your life and all the uncharted territory that comes with it? Because true change cannot happen unless you want it. Do you want to be made whole? Right. Now, brothers and sisters, all of us reading this text would assume that anybody who's dealing with an issue for 38 years should want to be made whole. Lord have mercy. But always pay close attention when Jesus asks a question that he already knows the answer to. Because it could very well be that Jesus asked this man this question. Because something in him may not want to be whole and healed from the inside out. We have evidence of this because after we see his condition, number two, we see his complaint. When Jesus asked this man, do you want to be made whole? Instead of him jumping up with a resounding yes, he gives an excuse. He says, sir, as if Jesus is bothering him as he's getting a suntan by the pool. Sir, I have no man to bring me to the pool to get the healing I need to be made whole. And every time I kind of halfway get there, 
some other crazy person steps over me and jumps in the pool before I can get there. Sir, I, don't, don't get my hopes up this morning. Don't, don't, don't get me all excited for nothing. Because I have nobody, somebody shout nobody, to help me get in this pool to get the miracle that I need. Now notice Jesus never asked the man if he needed help. Jesus never asked the man if he had friends to assist him. All Jesus asked him was do you want it? Do you want to be made whole? But this man is so blinded by the pool of water in Bethesda that he doesn't even realize he's standing in front of the fountain of living water from heaven above. And he's allowed his problem to blind him from realizing that he does have a man who can help him out. A man that has all power. A man that can open blind eyes. A man that can heal the sick. A man that can raise the dead. There is somebody who wants to help you. But you're so blinded by your hopelessness that you don't even recognize he's standing in front of your face. Brothers and sisters, I don't care how dark this life may get. Never get to a place where you forget that when men and women don't help you, there's a God above who is willing to help you. And if God be for you, I wish I had a witness, then he's more than anybody or any devil that could be against you. He doesn't even realize that all the help he needs is standing right there in front of him. Because he's so concerned about the fact that he cannot get to the pool when the power behind the pool has already come to him. But brothers and sisters, you have to be careful with this because I've discovered in life that there are some folk who don't want to change. I'm getting ready to wrap it up. Y'all get happy now. I've, I've met some people who've been pitiful for so long that they actually have become accustomed to all the attention. Y'all ain't saying nothing. And all the sympathy that they feel and receive from other people. Some of y'all folks like to be messed up. Because of the attention that it brings to you. Because you thrive in having folk worried about you. And concerned about you. And you like the help and the assistance that comes with being miserable. Some of us have been down for so long. We don't want to get up. We don't want to change. Because we're afraid of what will come with having a transition from what we've known all of our lives. Brothers and sisters, don't miss your blessing. Because you want to stay down when God is trying to pick you up. This man almost missed it. Because he was so concerned about not getting in that old stanky pool. When the son of God was in front of him, asking him if he wants his blessing. I'm sorry, sir. I, 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 I can't get my hopes up. I can't even answer that question. Because every time I even get close to the pool, somebody steps over me. Because church, how many of you know that people don't mind stepping over you? When they're trying to get whatever it is they need. Folk will tell you they love you and they're there for you all day long. But let all hell break loose. And you will find out that folks that used to hold your hand will step on your face. Try to get what they need so that other people don't get it. Brothers and sisters, I can't get in the pool, the lame man says, because I have nobody to help me and to bring me to where I need to be. Brothers and sisters, as I get ready to close, Jesus could have left that man right there. You feel hopeless? You feel like you don't have the necessary help and resources? Well then, better luck next time. But what I love about Jesus, 
is that even though this man gave the wrong answer to the question, Jesus still gave a full credit. Y'all missing me here. Because even though he was skeptical, and even though he was too busy worried about getting to the pool instead of letting Jesus get to him, the Bible says that Jesus still gave him the miracle that he was looking for, even though we're not even sure that he wanted it. Because the Bible says that even though he didn't ask for it, and even though he didn't ask for or answer the question correctly, Jesus still gave him the answer he wanted. Jesus told him, rise, look at the verse, take up your bed and walk. Because even though you're acting like you don't want it, I will still give it to you anyhow. And brothers and sisters, you ought to thank God for grace this morning. For all the times God still gave you a blessing. Even though you weren't looking for it. All the times God made a way for you. Even though you didn't ask for it. I think I got somebody in here who can lift your hands this morning. Because you owe God some back praise. You got some hallelujahs on layaway. Because he gave you a new house. When you didn't think you had enough credit. Gave you the new vehicle. When you didn't even have a cosigner. Allowed you to survive the surgery. When all odds were against you. You weren't even looking for it. But God still dropped it off to you anyhow. And you ought to thank God. For blessings. That he sent your way. That you didn't even ask for. Do I have a witness here? As I get ready to close this morning. We see number one. His condition. Lame for 38 years. Number two, his complaint. There's nobody to help me. But then after the condition and the complaint, we see his command from Jesus. Rise up and start walking. But while you're walking, I want you to do one thing for me. You see that bed right there that you've been laying on for 40 years. You see that bed right there that's been your pallet and your beggar rag. You see that bed right there that's laid out so nicely. I want you to do me one favor. When you start walking, take up your bed and bring your bed with you. I want you to carry that bed everywhere that you walk. Or you gonna help me close here and as I thought about it, church, I don't know why exactly Jesus wanted that man to carry that bed with him. Why do I need this bed when now I have power to walk around? Why do I need this bed when I no longer have to beg for anything? Why do I need, why do I need this bed? When I'm no longer dependent on other people, my body is healed. I can go where I want to go, and I can do what I want to do. I'm not sure, beloved, why he had to carry his bed, but I do have a sneaky suspicion. The last verse says that this day was the Sabbath day. Do I have a witness? And the religious leaders who were against Jesus, they taught everybody that you can't carry anything with you on the Sabbath day. Do you hear what I'm saying? In other words, Mount Calvary, that man would have stood out like a sore thumb carrying that bed around on the Sabbath day. And I do believe that that's exactly what Jesus wanted. He wanted everybody to pay attention to this man carrying this bed. Because his bed would become his testimony. I used to be lame and crippled. I used to be down and out. 
I used to be strung out on drugs. I used to be an alcoholic. I used to be this paralyzed man. But look at me now. I met a man named Jesus who told me to rise up and start walking. So when you see my bed, you see my testimony. When you see my bed, you see my story. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And as I get ready to take my seat, is there anybody here who got a bed this morning? Is there anybody here who got a testimony? Is there anybody here who wants to let somebody else know? I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. I was deeply staying within, seeking to rise no more. Y'all not helping me here. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters, he lifted me. Now safe am I. Is there anybody here who's been lifted up? Did he pick you up, turn you around, and place your feet up? on solid ground you ought to give God glory for every day he picked you up from you ought to give God praise for every situation he delivered you out of and as I take my seat nowhere in the text do I see where this man gave God any glory nowhere in the text do I see where this man said thank you Jesus for healing me but can I tell you this morning that you don't have to be like that lame man who didn't tell God thank you but while you're here right now you can lift your hands you can open up your mouth you can shout glory you can shout hallelujah and you can thank the Lord for every situation he brought you through. Anybody glad this morning? Y'all ain't glad in here. Anybody grateful this morning? Anybody want to tell him thank you? Anybody want to shout hallelujah? You ought to lift your hand. Tell him yeah. Shout glory. Thank you, Jesus for lifting me up when I had nobody else. Everybody all over on your feet. Brothers and sisters, as we get ready to leave from this place together, I have one homework assignment for you. Reflect upon all the beds that Jesus has raised you from. Reflect upon all the paralyzed situations that God gave you power to walk away from. And carry your bed with you everywhere you go as your testimony that if God did it for me, he could do it for you too. Brothers and sisters, the doors of the church are open. To anybody who may not know this Jesus, who is still picking people off of lame beds, the doors of the church are open to anybody who doesn't know this grace and mercy that this man saw in the pool of Bethesda. We're going to ask our deacons to come. And if you don't know this Jesus, we invite you to try him today. Lord, do it. 
Doors of the church are open. Lord, do it for me. There may be one who doesn't know of. Lord, do it. If you don't know this, Jesus, won't you come? Do it for me right now. If you find yourself in a paralyzed situation, won't you come this morning? Oh, Lord. need prayer, won't you come this morning? We'll pray with you and for you. Lord, oh, do it for me. If you need a church home and you want to join the Mount Calvary Baptist Church, won't you come? We'll receive you with open arms. Oh, Lord, do it. If you need them, won't you come? Don't wait another day. Do it for me right now. If you read your Bibles, then you know the story. Who could not see Oh, but one day He heard that Jesus was passing by And he said Master, please have mercy on me and just like you helped that blind man, he could do it for you. Say, Lord. Bless you, God bless you. Oh, Lord. Oh, do it for me. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, we have somebody here this morning. I'm going to let her tell you all her name. My name is Carol Lee Williams, and I came back to the church. Yeah. Amen. She says, I'm coming back. I want to recommit, and I want to get back on track with my church family. Let's give God praise for her this morning. And we'll pray for her before we take our seat. Father God, we thank you. For your dear daughter who has come to recommit herself to a deeper relationship with her church family. Father God, bless in her, strengthen her, encourage her right now, oh God, to continue to press toward the mark for the high calling of God. Heavenly Father, whatever she stands in need of, touch now with your mighty power and your precious spirit. And we will always be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise that you so rightfully deserve. These are the many blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give God praise. Right now. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this couple who is standing in the gap for a dear, precious loved one of their family who is currently in the hospital, oh God. We ask now, dear Father, that you would move mightily in the only way that you know how. Father God, send your spirit, your powerful touch, right where this individual is, oh God. And by your grace and your mercy, move on her behalf like never before. God, we thank you for a loving family who's at this altar standing in the gap. Oh God, move now according to their faith and their willingness to intercede on behalf of another. And Father God, we patiently await the good news of whatever decision you make. For you make no mistakes and you do all things well. God, we give you glory in advance for what you're going to do. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. God bless you. God bless you. Do it for me right now. Amen. That'll be all. You may be seated. And we'll receive Deacon Beche who has some announcements for us before we leave. Amen. Let's give God praise this morning. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Good morning, Mount Calvary. Got several announcements here for you uh, beginning this week, uh, tomorrow, uh, especially Monday, tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. The food pantry will need help unloading a food truck. So if you're available tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock or at any time you want to volunteer at the food shelter, please make you avail yourself to that. Uh, 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, back here at the Sharon Center on Julia Street. Also, Tuesday uh, at 5 p.m. is our uh, trustee meeting. Uh, Tuesday at 5 p.m. is the uh, trustee meeting. Also, the Reverend uh, Larry W. Norbert Memorial Scholarship the, uh, uh, is presented annually in remembrance of Pastor Norbert, who served this congregation for over 30 years. High school graduates who meet the, the eligibility requirements are encouraged to apply for this uh, academic award. Among the eligibility requirements, Applicants must have membership at Mount Calvary for at least one year and regular church attendance. An application packet including detailed requirements will be available in the church office beginning tomorrow and they are to be completed by May 18th. Uh, the, for, this is from the scholarship committee, Sister Pam Landry and Sister uh, Virginia Lewis. Also, uh, Vacation Bible School will be held June 3rd through the 6th and there will be additional information uh, coming for that as well. Uh, also, one hour prayer power for the 2024 state testing, Monday, April 22nd, that's next Monday, at 6 to 7 p.m. here at Mount Calvary. Students and parents, educators are invited to attend. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mount Calvary. I have a special announcement. I'd like to announce that on April 28th at 3 o'clock p.m. at Mount Calvary, the Union 6th District Missionary Association will be celebrating their Women's Day program. Our speaker for that day is none other than our First Lady, Mrs. Keandre Andrews, our First Lady. Our First Lady will be the speaker, so right now I'm asking every last woman and male in here, it's a Women's Day program, but it's for everyone to come out. The colors are purple and silver, but you come out no matter what you have to wear. We will have vendors. In fact, we will have six vendors, so ladies and gentlemen, come early so you can go and peruse and select some things and even afterwards. We will have food. There's a lot of stuff going on, gifts. All these things, but the primary reason I'm standing here this morning is to say to you that our First Lady will be our speaker, and all of us should be happy and clap our hands for Keandre Andrews. <laughs> 